Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is the Pulitzer Prize-winning author who spent four years as U.N. ambassador and is currently the administrator of USAID. Please welcome back to The Late Show, Samantha Power. <laughs> Nice to see you again. Nice digs. Yeah, it is nice, nice digs, isn't it? No, you actually have... Have you physically been here since COVID, or is it, was it only over Zoom for a long Zoom, time? Zoom, Zoom. We nice, Zoomed. <laughs> we did. Nice to see you again, and we'll, we'll come back to the friendly confines. Amazing. Uh, last summer, I guess, over Zoom, you and I discussed uh, President Biden's pledge to send COVID vaccines uh, around the world, and USAID, of course, is part of the administration and distribution of that. Um, what do you make of President Biden saying that the pandemic is over? Do you think he got that right? Because there's been some backpedaling at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And go ahead and throw your boss under the bus right now. Um, let's think back to when President Biden uh, entered office. Um, deaths since then are down 90%. The pandemic, we all know we're here. Look, we're here. Uh, school, schools are open. Um, I'm not the pathetic homeschooler that I once was uh, during the pandemic. Many, Will your many children others ever not, recover no, from never, your teaching never. the math? No. The setback is permanent. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think what he was saying was that COVID, needless to say, is not the disruptive threat that it was. And it, because we have the tools available, everybody should go and get their variant booster and their flu shot at the same time. Uh, we are in a position uh, to manage this. Our economy has reopened. We are trying to, as USAID, ensure the same thing happens in even the poorest countries in the world. And we have made great headway. Well, let's talk about the, the, the vaccines. Because sure. last time we were talking, there were hundreds of millions of vaccines were going around the world, if not, if not billions. How did that rollout go? Did, did we make an impact around the world? Well, I, I was just meeting not long ago today with the vice president of Tanzania, just as recently as June, Tanzania's vaccination rate was about 15%, not what we're seeking, not so good. Uh, now it is nearly 61%, and they're trending toward the 70%. And that's, that's just one because country. of our health. It's, that's because we invested not only in the shots themselves, we have distributed 600 million vaccines, donated them for free, no strings attached, but we've also invested on the ground the resources to, in the, the health delivery systems. You know, the mobilization campaigns. How do you fight misinformation? Same kind of misinformation that we have here, but it took longer to get vaccines to developing countries, so that misinformation had much longer to take root mm -hmm. without people seeing the benefits of vaccines, which so many of us have been privileged to see. So there's a lot that goes into moving from having a shot to getting a shot into the arm, and that's the support that USAID and the United States offer to developing countries. You say, uh, you say no strings attached. What about soft strings? Because we've talked about... United States soft power, about diplomacy and helping other countries as a form of projecting soft power. What, what does that do for us as a nation? How does that help our security and our position around the world to have done this for these countries? Are, are they going to remember? Well, I think if you just personalize it and think of one's own hours of need and who picked up the phone to call you, who showed up, you know, and made your family food when you were in a time of crisis, Countries remember. They, they also remember that these are donated, that we're not asking for, for money back in return. They remember the training of the health workers, and they know that that training is, yes, as it happens for a pandemic in the here and now, but we try to do the training in a manner that will also have knock-on effects on primary health care support you know, going forward. We're also making investments. We, we don't want them to have to rely on our vaccines. Mm -hmm. We want Africa to have its own vaccine manufacturing capability. So mm -hmm. USAID and other actors in the US government are investing in manufacturing hubs around the world so that that sovereignty around health exists within communities. Well, um, one of the reasons, <laughs> speaking of the world, Sovereign countries helping each other. One of the reasons why you're here t tonight, we always love having you, is that the UN General Assembly is, is in session right now. And as I was mentioning earlier on the show, there was a little bit of traffic, a little bit of traffic out there. <laughs> a lot of critics of the UN say that the General Assembly is essentially meaningless at this point, that nobody listens to the speeches. It's all about the corporate donors and the NGOs. You're an idealist, but a pragmatist at the same time. As a pragmatic idealist, what is the benefit of the General Assembly? Um, not the traffic, and I would just note that 
I actually got out of my car, my U.S. government delegation car, yep. and took the subway to get to one of my meetings today because I, I, uh, you're, you're, I was stuck too. You're, you're one of the good guys, that's yeah. why. So, uh, but I, I think to your question, look, this is a venue where all the world's heads of state come together or leaders uh, in some fashion. And it's a chance for the United States to mobilize those leaders to solve really hard problems. And right now, for example, the United States is the world's top humanitarian donor by a long shot. Uh, so when there's a famine or when there's a climate emergency or when there's a conflict, the U.S. shows up and provides hundreds of millions of dollars worth of food, medicine, sanitation support, health support. Well, we want other countries to be contributing more. The United Nations General Assembly is a really good place to say, we've done this, what have you done? And even to compare, there's a famine now uh, in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya. There was something akin to what's happening now uh, five or six years ago. Countries gave much more then than they have so far today. To use that venue to actually just compare and contrast and say, well, you gave several hundred million dollars in food the last time. Please, can you show up for these very vulnerable people at this time? So that's one example. It's also a chance uh, to uh, share innovation. Uh, the United States is devising drought resistance and heat resistant seeds. You know, this is a chance to let heads of state in developing countries know that these seeds exist and be in a position to launch partnerships so that USAID can move out and make sure those seeds actually get to small farmers mm -hmm. at a time when climate change, of course, is wreaking havoc on agriculture all over the world. So, so there's a lot to be done. Again, in, it's mainly mobilization of coalitions around the toughest problems. And we're very interested in many of these problems because they also are gonna affect the United States. If we can't curb emissions in big emitting countries and get people to, to you know, move to solar and to wind, like President Biden now has been able to make this substantial investment domestically, uh, that's gonna mean you know, more climate emergencies here in the United States as well. If we can't build the pandemic surveillance architecture so people can see viruses before they become pandemics, then we could get stuck with another pandemic uh, that harms Americans as well. So our fates are connected, and the UN is both a symbol of that, but it's also the place you actually get the connective tissue to come together to, to tackle these challenges. Well, let, let's talk about a challenge that's facing the world right now. Let's talk about one of the challenges facing the world right now. My understanding is that one of the, the greatest challenges that USAID is, is, is hoping to help mitigate is that is the food shortage around the world. And that uh, crop yields are down partially because of uh, global warming, but also the war in Ukraine, which provides 25% of the world's wheat. Is this Putin's fault, this food shortage? Because he's blaming the West. He's blaming us. Yeah. And how, how hard is, is, is the U in a place where you can fight that misinformation? Yeah, I traveled this summer uh, to two of the worst affected uh, countries of the food crisis, Kenya and Somalia, um, where basically we're on the brink of famine in, in, in parts of both of those countries. And I, I brought support for f fertilizer on behalf of the American people. I brought additional support for some of these seeds so that farmers can, can plant uh, in the seasons ahead. Uh, and of course, I brought emergency humanitarian assistance. Foreign Minister Lavrov came a few days after I did to the same countries, and he brought misinformation and lies, uh, which don't feed anybody. And so the one thing I would say is there's a lot of noise out there, and the Russian Federation is you know, tr trying to turn that noise up on, on very high decibel. My experience in traveling to these countries that are very vulnerable right now is they know the difference. They, they, they know that President Putin for a very long time blocked the Ukraine that was in Ukrainian ports ready to reach countries like Somalia, Kenya, places like Lebanon, Syria, Yemen. He just blocked it. Finally, uh, there was a breakthrough and that some of those grains are now moving, but prices had already spiked uh, because of the, the food shortage that, that that contributed to. I will say the underlying conditions are chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. Climate change is a chronic condition. The Horn of Africa is experiencing its fourth straight failed rainy season. That's never happened before in recorded history. I was just in Pakistan a couple weeks ago. Stephen, it was honestly, <laughs> I felt like I was in the apocalypse. I was flying you know, inland about 200 miles from you know, the nearest ocean. And I was looking down, I was like, wait, that's ocean. And then, no, actually, a third of the country is underwater. 
because of melting glaciers combined with monsoon rains that are five times as intense as they've ever had before. And what you see when you can see like little sort of tops, rooftops sometimes poking out or you know, 12 meter high trees that are where you see just the rim of the tree. I mean, that's how much water there is on the ground. But you also see the croplands that have just been ravaged by these floods. So you either have too much water or too little water everywhere you look. And part of what we want to do as USAID and on behalf of the American people, and there's bipartisan support for this right now, which is wonderful, is not only you know, feed people who've just lost their cropland because of flooding or because of drought, but actually give them the resilience to not be in a position where they're, they, they're taking humanitarian assistance. Nobody wants emergency humanitarian assistance. They want to be able to plant their seeds, take their harvest, and deal and, and, and relocate in some cases uh, so as to be in places that are more hospitable given the changing climate. What, what is this job like? <laughs> it's, uh, all these different places yeah. you're naming, do you know where you are when you wake up in the morning? Um, the trips are great because you get close and you feel the human consequences of the challenges that we we're all reading about you know, back here and that many Americans are experiencing in different ways. Um, you see the resilience, the, the, the sturdiness, that, that hunger people have to get back to work and not be you know, receiving assistance. They all want trade, not aid. I mean, honestly, Stephen, I, the way I view this job is I was in the Obama administration so fortunate for eight years. It was my first time in public service. Then I had to live the next four years out of government. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, powerful as tweets are, it didn't have quite the same, you know, mm. impact potentially. And so I feel so lucky to be in the room where it happens, in, in a position to look at America's toolkit and to be thinking, okay, this is really hard. This is harder than maybe anything I've ever seen before. But we've got the best scientists in this country. We've got bipartisan support right now for food security response. We have the generosity that translates into support for Ukrainians that is, you know, transcendent. I mean, what it means to the people of Ukraine in their hour of need being bombarded and to see again and again Americans stepping up, not only with military support, but helping businesses relocate, uh, helping survivors of sexual violence, helping document war crimes. I mean, the United States is in it for the long haul and is in it in a way that you, again, if you put yourself in their shoes, what would you wish the United States response to be? I just feel really lucky to be a part of trying to figure out what that is since, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. You know, we're really fortunate to be in this position rather than to be living next to Putin. Well, I, I want to talk about, I know we got to go here, just, I got to go here just one second. I'm getting the high sign over here. But speaking of the eight years you spent in the Obama administration, what one of the other people, of course, in that administration was at the time Vice President Joe Biden. Um, now he's your boss. What was he like as, it's a bit of a strong word, but what was he like as a coworker, let's say? I'll, I'll mention to him that that was, that, yeah, he was my, my, my coworker as the vi <laughs> Vice President. But um, he was, Joe Biden is exactly behind the scenes what Joe Biden is, you know, out in, in great grand display. And so we'd be in meetings and I'd be saying something maybe that might be landing like a lead balloon in the center of the meeting. With uh, the, a little, the president with the, the with the then president, President Obama, um, sparring a little bit, maybe a little, you know, again, counter to what others might, might want to be doing at the time. And I'd just kind of be deflated and feel <laughs> unjoined. And next thing, somebody would pass me a note from many seats down because the vice president was right next to the president. And it would be a note from Joe Biden saying, that's exactly why you're here. You know, never be quiet. Uh, there was another note, go Irish. Uh, <laughs> you know? So that's... Yeah. That's Joe. Yeah. Samantha, lovely to see you. Great Thank to you see for being you. here. Thank you. U.S. AID Administrator, Samantha Power, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> 